Bring Pete smiling face around the place, uh, but we'll, we'll get him up and pray for him. Next week will be your last Sunday, mate, is it, before you head overseas. Um, good to see everyone again. Uh, I was away last week, but it's good to be back with you today. Uh, we're going to be looking at just the last couple of verses of that section in Philippians, verse 17 and 18. So it'd be really helpful, as always, if you've got a Bible open in front of you, uh, if you can pull that up on your phone. Uh, that'd be great. Um, well, if you're here new uh, at Make this morning, uh, really glad that you could be here with us. Uh, just so you know, uh, I'm a bit of a fan of my coffee, um, and I was thinking about it, and I don't think I've actually used a coffee illustration in a sermon for a little while, so I thought it was high time uh, to pull one in again. Uh, so back the 28th of May, 2019, so you're going back about two and a half years, uh, I jumped on a plane, I went down to Sydney, uh, I had three days of training down there with a, a group of other pastors, and, and the, the, the guy who ran this training, uh, he influenced me uh, in my consumption of coffee. So just going back a little bit, uh, when I'd moved to Mackay, before that I'd had an espresso machine and kind of um, made my own coffees, textured my own milk and went to all that effort. But it just, uh, in the end, it was taking too much time and so uh, I gave the coffee machine away to someone else and I got one of these, if Ethan, you're happy to get it on the screen. So for about seven or eight years I was using one of these. If you know, it's an AeroPress. Uh, you get your coffee grinds, you just pour a bit of hot water in, press the air through it and bang, you've got your coffee shot. It's a a whole lot uh, quicker and easier. Uh, so seven or eight years I'd been rolling with that. I was very happy um, drinking coffee from the AeroPress, but I went down to this conference uh, the 28th of May 2019, uh, and the guy who was organising the conference, he brought along one of these. Uh, so it's called a, a Breville uh, Barista Touch. Uh, espresso coffee machine and he just had it there. Uh, we were able to make coffees uh, for ourselves during our time at this conference. Uh, you kind of clicked in the handle and it, it did the, the coffee grinds. Uh, you pressed another button, it did the coffee shot. You pressed another button and it textured the milk exactly the way you wanted it, exactly the temperature you wanted it. Uh, after three days I was sold. I'd been influenced and so I went home uh, and then I had to try and influence my wife to let me buy one. Um, thankfully, it didn't take too long to get her across the line. But the influence didn't stop there. Uh, I don't think I got too many others within our church family to buy one of these as I made them coffees on my brand new coffee machine. I did notice that there's a fair few people who did coffee machine upgrades at that time, though. Uh, maybe not uh, spending quite as much as I'd convinced my wife to. Uh, but the influence continued. Uh, that Christmas, I took my coffee machine with us on holidays. Uh, my sister um, doesn't drink coffee. Uh, but we were with my family for seven days and after three or four days she decided, okay, I'll try one of these coffees. I'm glad to say that when she went home she was having discussions with her husband, maybe we do really need a coffee machine. Um, went to a Christian camp and we're making coffees for people there. I got all these emails from people afterwards. What was, what was the model of that coffee machine that you had? Um, I loved it. Feels good to have an influence, doesn't it? Um, but I think even better than having an influence uh, like that, um, we can take that off the screen now. Uh, even better than that kind of influence, of course, is, is having an influence for good, an actual real positive influence on someone. Um, a couple of years back, I went to a conference down in Sydney and, and was just talking to this um, young guy. He'd, he'd planted a church uh, a few years after us, but as I was talking to him, he said, Joy, I can remember uh, just before uh, you moved to Mackay, you got up on the stage, they interviewed you, you were talking about how God had led you to go and plant this church, and he said it really had an impact on me thinking through uh, church planning, and that, that was part of his journey uh, to going and planting a church in the region he had gone to. And sometimes you don't really know the influence you're having. It's nice when you have those moments where someone actually feeds back and you realise, I have actually had an influence for good. How do, you, how do you do that? How, how do you influence people for good? And I don't know if there's ever really been a time where, uh, as a culture, people have been more focused on this type of question. I'm, I'm sure there has been, but uh, you, you just think about our world today. Gone are the days when people uh, do things out of duty or do things because it's the tradition or, or do things because there's nothing else happening and there's no other options. No, there, there's so much on the table and so we're... we're highly reliant on being influenced by others. I've talked to business owners who the predominant amount of money that they will spend in trying to advertise is paying for social influences to put their product out to the world. They're trying to buy a little bit of the influence that this person has on the, the social media space. Our world cares 
deeply about influence. I don't know uh, if you read the Daily Mercury, but this last week they did a list of the, the, the top 50, I think they call them the, the power people in the Mackay region, those who are exerting the biggest influence. It's something that we think about. Uh, and, and I think, on the other hand, as we maybe feel a, a, a lack of influence on others, it can be one of those things that causes us to lose energy and just feel a bit stuck in life. Uh, we, we might feel like we've got a whole lot to offer, but if there's no multiplication effect, if no one's listening, no one's catching on, it can feel like there's maybe not as much point. It can be demoralising. And you might respond at that point and say, well, you, you don't want to do things to, to have an influence on others. That's the bad motivation. And I think that's something worth thinking about. We're going to circle back around to that at the end of our time in this passage in Philippians. But I think it's worth thinking about the fact that Jesus Christ, uh, as he left this earth, what did he say to his disciples? What were his final instructions to his disciples? He said, go and make disciples, baptising them in my name and teaching them to do the things that I've taught you to do. He calls his disciples to have an influence. How do we do that? I'm going to pray, uh, and then we'll have a look at God's Word. Let's pray. Uh, loving Father, Lord, we just um, pray that you would guide us on this topic that is kind of a really big one for us culturally at the moment. And Father, we just pray that we would help, you would just help us to be able to see things from your perspective. And Lord, that you might use us, Lord, to have an influence for good on our community, on our families, in our workplace, um, and on the world around us. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, well, uh, this term we've been working through this uh, short section in Philippians. We've actually been covering uh, what you might call six principles in thinking through how we can go about shining like stars uh, in our local community. Uh, we've talked about the spiritual insights that God gives us through the scriptures, um, partly that life is meant to be lived under God. We're meant to put ourselves under God and so under other people in service of them. Uh, we've then talked about how do we actually integrate that and pull that into life. Well, we need to catch on to a little bit of God and his spiritual power, his love. It is God who's the one who's going to work that in us. Uh, we talked about how to interrupt unhelpful behaviours, don't grumble. Um, we, we talked about the place of the word of God in allowing us to separate what's kind of us and our, our sinful nature and, and what's actually coming to us from God, uh, receiving that inspiration from God. Uh, and then two weeks ago, we talked about interpersonal influence. Uh, and today, we're think, uh, sorry, interpersonal skills. Today, we're talking about influencing others. Here's the big idea. How do you influence others? You rejoice with others. And specifically, you rejoice with others as they embrace being poured out. And so let's have a look, uh, those two very simple ideas, let's have a look in Philippians 2 about that. If you turn up verse 17. Paul says, But even if I am poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and I rejoice with all of you. And just to get a, a little bit of the context here, uh, Paul, of course, if you remember through the series, he's uh, locked up in prison, most likely in Rome. Uh, he's getting towards the end of his life. And, and he's writing to this church in Philippi that he's known uh, the people there for 10, 15 years. And he's writing to them and saying that, that he's really considering the possibility that he might be put to death very soon. And so he thinks it likely that he, in a sense, could be poured out like a drink offering. His life is just about done and, and he might be poured out on their more substantial uh, sacrifice and service. They might go on serving the Lord and ministering and, and blessing people for many, many years ahead. And Paul says, as he considers that prospect, that his life might come to nothing, uh, whereas their lives might come to much, he rejoices with them, uh, if that is the possibility. It's this very other person-centred perspective that Paul has on life. Um, just recently, uh, this book's been published. It's called Wisdom in Leadership. It's by a Christian minister called Craig Hamilton. Um, I was really excited to, to get this book. Uh, Craig had written an earlier book a couple of years ago called Just Wisdom in Leadership. This one's Wisdom in Leadership Development. Um, and, and the reason I was excited for it was because I'd been to a conference where I'd heard uh, Craig speak uh, 
and he was really talking about how do you, how do you make the shift from being a doer uh, to becoming a leader. And he had this just one insight that I thought was incredibly profound. He said that the, the one shift that needs to happen is that your, your metric or the, or the way you evaluate success has to change if you want to change from being a doer to a leader. As a doer, uh, if you do the job well, so you, you think about uh, in the context of church life, you uh, set up morning tea or, or you do a kid's talk or you, you lead a Bible study group during the week, that's kind of doing the task. And you can have the metric that that's success. To move to become a leader, you actually have to move from being your outputs being the success to other people succeeding becomes your success, if that makes sense. So if you're going to lead the morning tea team, instead of it being about you preparing a beautiful morning tea, uh, you actually change your metric of success to be, I'm going to be really happy when someone else comes and does a great job of setting up the morning tea. Uh, As a Bible study leader, Uh, to become a leader of other leaders in that context, I'm going to really rejoice when uh, I see someone else come in and lead a Bible study with me there. uh, I'm going to rejoice in that particular circumstance and situation. Uh, This is the kind of shift that Paul's talking about. This is how influence comes. Another kind of tangible example. Um, When when I first moved to Mackay, Um, I thought that the way to lead a successful team meeting was about me being really well prepared, uh, me knowing kind of where I was taking people, what the decisions were that needed to be made. And so I'd rock up at the meeting, um, some of you are probably around at this time, uh, and and I'd just talk through what I thought was the best decision and I'd get people's input, but really it was all about me and the thinking that I'd do before the meeting in the study. And what I realised was I actually had to change the way I thought about success in that context or doing a good job in that context to actually realise that it was a whole much better meeting if I could rock up to that meeting and have particular things that we were trying to brainstorm and think through and, and have not given it any thought at all and open up the discussion and kind of not be the expert to let other people give input and ideas and for that to be celebrated and thought through and weighed out in the moment, that was actually a whole much better meeting because it wasn't about me looking good, uh, it was about everyone in that team meeting looking good. And really this brings us to the second part that Paul has to point out to us in these verses. Uh, Influence is about rejoicing with others but specifically, it's rejoicing with others as they embrace being poured out. If I can just read uh, verse 17 again and then uh, flow on into verse 18 of Philippians chapter 2. Paul says, But even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you, so you too should be glad and rejoice with me. When you think about what Paul is actually saying there, it's it's actually a a challenging thought that he's putting before us. He's saying to the Philippians that as Paul considers the fact that he might be just about to give up his life, he's saying the Philippians should look at him and rejoice that his life would be poured out in that kind of way. And and Paul actually had a tricky time with this in the kind of latter part of his life. There was uh, a period where he realised that that God was actually leading him towards his death. Uh, Acts chapter 20 and following, he starts telling people, I'm not going to see you again. The Holy Spirit's showing me that I'm headed for suffering. And in fact, in Acts chapter 21, verse 12, uh, there's kind of this prophetic word that comes. A a guy takes his belt and binds his hands and says in the same way, the owner of this belt is going to be bound as he goes to Jerusalem. And so all the other Christians gathered around Paul and said, don't go, don't suffer, don't head for that. And Paul, what was his response? He, He kind of rebuked them. He said, why are you breaking my heart? I want to do what God's telling me to do. I want to pour my life out. He wanted to actually go to Jerusalem and die just like his Lord Jesus had died in Jerusalem. And he says, you ought to be rejoicing with me. And it actually makes me think uh, 
of, of Jesus in his public ministry here on earth. When you think about Jesus, we're going to look at the beginning of Jesus' ministry uh, next term. We're going to be looking at Matthew's Gospel. And as Jesus first came and was announcing the Kingdom of God, it was all, uh, it, it all looked good and it looked amazing and he was healing people. And we're kind of getting a bit of an insight into what it would look like if God were to answer the prayer, God, your Kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. We're going to be thinking about that next term. But you see, there's that transition point in Jesus' ministry where he starts letting the disciples know that, yes, and part of my Father's kingdom coming is that I'm going to give up my life. The Jews, the Gentiles, they're going to gather, they're going to put me up on the cross. And do you remember how the disciples first responded to Jesus when he put this reality on the table? Peter said, (laughs) no, that's not how it's going to go down. And Jesus actually had to rebuke his own disciple, get behind me, Satan. Because you see, the nature of the kingdom of God is about pouring out of life. We need to be willing to celebrate where we see one another pouring life out. Um, Back when I was first training to be a a Christian minister, I was uh, at a church down in Brisbane, actually the one that Jonathan mentioned at the start, uh, St Lucia Bible Church, it's now called. Uh, I was training under Roy, who uh, Jonathan also mentioned. And and Roy... um, a couple of times a year we'd have these uh, staff meetings, we might even go away for a couple of days as a staff there at the church and, and, and kind of just think through the plans for the next period as a church. And Roy was a, a great encourager, uh, a great encourager. And we'd rock up at these meetings and um, to be honest, as, as a young kind of training minister, I'd walk away from some of those meetings kind of feeling like I'd given great input and that, that it had been this really encouraging discussion that I had a part to play but also kind of scratching my head and thinking man this this guy should have a bit better idea what he's actually doing <laughs> as he's leading these meetings it wasn't heaps of kind of talk of vision or kind of the, the things you associate with leadership but I've actually come to realize in the years after that the problem was with me uh, he was Roy willing to let us step into some of the stuff that he was dealing with. I mean, he was, he was pouring his life out in all sorts of different ways. And part of the way that he did that was to let our, us actually step into some of that planning and to think it through. And then he'd cheer us on as we stepped up and gave it a go. I would have got so much more out of it if I had been able to rejoice at the pouring out of life that he was doing. There's a key idea here that I think we cannot miss. Sometimes when it comes to being a leader, um, we can be concerned about asking other people to come on to our team and have to um, take on jobs and and put in effort. Uh, As the leader, you can feel like you want to protect people from having to put themselves out. You you don't want to ask too much of them. But I think what Paul's challenging us to do here is challenging us in this really tangible context of our relationships with other people to think through what is it that we're actually rejoicing in? Just to backtrack a little bit. We haven't covered this heaps yet as we've worked through the book of Philippians together the last few years, but there's actually a lot in this letter about joy. Uh, There's a whole lot about rejoicing. God willing, we'll come back to the letter next term and we'll be able to see this. Uh, If you've got... Philippians in a Bible, you might be able to scan your eyes and see Philippians 3 verse 1. Paul kind of repeats it a few times. He says, further my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. He says it chapter 4 verse 4, rejoice in the Lord. Always, I'll say it again, rejoice. And and finally that section that the kids talk was about, um, chapter 4 verse 10, he says that he rejoices greatly again in the Lord, that at last the Philippians have renewed their concern for him. You see, Paul's not rejoicing that he's got money but he's rejoicing because the Philippians are pouring themselves out he's rejoicing in the Lord and the things that please the Lord when it comes to influence the thing we rejoice in is what really matters if I can let you in on a little secret uh, we actually all have a whole lot more influence than any of us realize every day you are influencing people. Influencing people at work. Influencing people at home. 
even if you don't make any contact with another person for a whole period of time, you are having an influence by the decisions that you are making in not making that contact. I mean, forget the top 50 list in the paper of who the great influences are. We're all having influence. But you see, whether we like it or not, the thing that we are influencing people towards is the thing that we rejoice in, is the thing that we love. And if we love the Lord Jesus, then we will rejoice in others. That will be a pouring out of our life. But we will also rejoice when others pour out their life and so on and so forth down the line. It becomes a question of, what is my joy? Uh, What is it that I do truly love? And you might be thinking through uh, even that initial point, as I I talked about this book, Wisdom in Leadership Development, how how do you make this transition from not just being focused on the stuff you're doing to to being focused on uh, kind of your success, being about other people's success? How, How do you make that transition? I think sometimes it's just about taking a moment to to think about others, even just to be thankful for others. Now, this morning before I started preparing the talk, uh, it was like God just prompting me, just sit down for a minute. And he just got me thinking through different people within our congregation here, different people who, in a whole range of different ways, are pouring their life out for others. Some who are doing that in the context of their family life. Uh, others who are doing that in the context of our church family life. Uh, Jay is the kids director here and so I am privy to some of the calls that come through of people who get sick and so then other kids church leaders have got to uh, give up their time and energy to fill that gap. I mean there's people pouring themselves out all over the place. Sometimes just taking a moment to thank God for that, to, to think of the other, even as Jonathan helped us to pray this morning for those in totally different situations to us around the world, missionaries who support. As I took that moment this morning, it it lifted my spirit to think about others. And you might be wrestling with this idea of uh, asking others to to do things or or actually um, being a team leader and not wanting to put pressure on others. You don't like seeing others being busy. But do you know, as, as you invite others in to to serve or to do a job or to take a responsibility, you're actually creating space. Space where, yeah, they they could fail. Uh, They could bite off too much and you have to have the conversation about it's okay if you um, step back from that responsibility. But you're also creating space for them to shine. And they can't shine unless you make them that space. And finally, for some of us, we might be wrestling through Uh, if we're actually realising that the thing I love, my great joy, in some ways is not the Lord, the things of the gospel, the things of our risen Lord who poured out his life. How, how How do you make that your joy? Well, I think Philippians is such a great book for this. We've kept turning back to Philippians 2, 6 and following, thinking about the gospel and just reflecting on the nature of God. But even chapter 3, As Paul talks about this idea of rejoicing in the Lord, he really unpacks it for us and, as I said, we'll come back to this next year. But it's all about, it's not about me and my accomplishments. As you come to Philippians 3, it's all about Jesus and the fact that he has poured out his life for me. I have righteousness, I have right standing because of what he has poured out for me. And as I reflect on that, it actually frees me to pour myself out, to rejoice in the other. And so we need to keep coming back to that gospel. We started with this simple question, how do we have an influence for good? We've seen that it comes through rejoicing with others and specifically rejoicing as others embrace being poured out. Uh, yesterday on Facebook I saw uh, promotional material on a new book that's been written by a Christian writer and speaker, uh, Francis Chan, and uh, it was a book about church unity and there was the statement Um, in the promotional material that said the church is one of the most divided institutions in the world. And and I kind of hope that that's overstating the case and I I, I hope that it is. But there's some ways in which it, it does resonate, isn't there? Can you imagine 
if every Christian person, as they came across another Christian person, could rejoice that this person knew and loved Jesus, even as that person confessed, Jesus is my Lord, that that just made us excited, that we could just rejoice in that. Can you imagine, even as as you went to work, that as you were looking at what other people were doing, even if you just saw just a little glimmer of the values and principles of Jesus, that you could see that and you could, you could rejoice in it, that you could say something about it to that work colleague, to kind of call forth a little bit of Christ even in that moment. Can you imagine the kind of impact that would ripple through the church if that was their attitude towards one another? Can you imagine the kind of impact that that would have through into our workplaces, into our home, into our family life. Rejoice in the Lord. I'm going to pray uh, and then we're going to open up for questions. If anyone has any questions, let's pray. Loving Father, we um, just thank you, Lord, for um, your word. We thank you uh, that the Lord Jesus has poured his life out for us. And Lord, we just pray that you would continue to shape us and form us in his image. Lord, we thank you that you have saved us as your children. And Lord, we pray that more and more we would live as your children in this world as we find our joy in you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so a chance for questions if anyone's...